So I'm ready because I already said my nonsense. Now I can talk sense. You're gonna roll this one. We want a little nonsense in this. Yeah. We don't want total total sense. I'm Tom Leeser. I've been invited uh, into my colleague's uh, studio. Uh, Adam Berg is sitting with me, and we're going to be discussing his work uh, for the upcoming show uh, at Edward Cella Art and Architecture. Hi, Adam. Hi, Tom. How are you? Thank you. How Thank are you, you for doing? inviting me into your studio. It's a pleasure. It's always a treat. So uh, the the show's title is consensual. Uh huh. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Well, so the idea of consensual came as as a, as a sort of as a as an invitation, but also as a, as a suggestion that uh, the type of invitation, like when you work on a show and and create a show, relies on a complicity with the viewer. So it's it's ne it's never just like coming from the artist, the creator, the producer to to the rec receiver. It's already embedded in a network of exchanges. And uh, in this particular sense, I was interested to kind of situate the viewer in, in the relation of being consensual in relation to the work, mm -hmm. but also in relation to art and science. Mm. It's, it's interesting because when we think about art, we always think about interpretation and passivity. And the making is, is on the part of the artist. Mm -hmm. And when we think about science, it's actually more about the passive truth of nature and so on, and about the enactment of knowledge on the part of the receiver. But in fact, it's pretty much the opposite. We reconstitute the artwork each time we, we experience, perceive mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. as opposed to science that often is based on perception and measurement, and the output, the posits, are already made up objects. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I was very intrigued by the possibility to look at the scientist's work on the one hand as continuous with that of the artist. Mm -hmm. But uh, it relates to another point that you, you bring up. I work in different media, such as video, drawing, painting, sculpture, but I, I actually don't feel at all compelled to define myself as an artist that works in different media. Uh, because again, uh, the, the relation between the media is not dialectical. It's not an opposition uh, between one or the other. It's more a, a sort of a tension that is necessary to generate almost reciprocally the overall images that come, that rises up. So even though I work with uh, discrete media, it's actually almost like a, a post thinking about the experience of installation art. Because for me, installation art was always unsatisfactory. Uh, that's how I started doing art. And uh, I moved away from it to uh, kind of a more discreet and autonomy uh, and the autonomy of the object, of a sort of a transcendent object, be it a video or a drawing or a painting. But I still think and see my works as dialogical as opposed to mutually exclusive. Uh, so even though I, 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 even though they're like discrete as media and as objects, they are part of a, of a larger whole that is dialogical. They converse between themselves. And I, so I see that, I see the relation between paintings and drawings and sculptures and video. Each time I reconfigure it, as a form of a conversation. And it allows also the viewer to move into a conversational uh, situation, as opposed to into a kind of almost uh, a sanctified condition that you have to respect the object. So it's also for me a, a way to move away, yes, to embrace essentialism, but, but refrain from becoming fetishistic. Mm -hmm. towards the object. Well, well I think you're, you're raising a really important point that seems to be very much rooted in contemporary practice right now, which is essentially we've moved beyond the notions of a conceptual and post-conceptual process, but we have adapted and incorporated a very important element that seems to show up um, more and more, 
within even artists who are making objects, and that is the role that the action of the artist plays within defining the narrative of the work. And I think that there is a, uh, what you might be doing here is adopting a, um, a conceptual strategy, but at the same time not, um, not trying to negate the object but in to bring the object into dialogue with that strategy. So can you explain your affinities and maybe even your detachment from the tradition of painting? Because painting is a big part of your practice. And it both, like I said, comes from a long tradition that you've inherited. But at the same time, your action as an artist works against that tradition. Well, it's interesting that the Latinate root of tradition is to trade. In a way, what we're doing in tradition, if to allude to uh, Merleau-Ponty, is we allow ourselves to be forgetful. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we immerse ourselves uh, in, in the forgetfulness of forms, of ideas. Uh, even the simple task of like moving a pencil on the wall or on a canvas in itself can constitute a radical drift from what used to be like 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And actually my sense is that because of the system of informations and, and acceleration of data that we are part of today, of social media and cybernetic uh, networks, the, the spans are getting shorter. In other words, it takes only a year or two before like even the same mark made by a pencil or a brush is reinvented through the prism. Mm -hmm. I, I like what you're mentioning in terms of this notion of um, a latency and how you refer to the gesture uh, entering into a latency. Um, but what we are experiencing now in this particular moment is actually a, a, a collapse of latency that we've never experienced before. So. Again, you're working in a very traditional format of, of painting. Where does the art lie now? Is it only on the wall for you, or is it in the data stream itself? Well, I think that there, it's a twofold question and a twofold answer, <laughs> probably, or at least an attempt to address the twofold question. I would say that, first of all, the, the uniqueness of painting, or the, the the relevance, if you want, of painting is it's uh, as an object, as an object image, it has to do with its singularity mm -hmm. and uh, the so-called loss of aura and, you know, all that. And, and on the other hand, I, I wouldn't be able to produce these paintings without doing video mm -hmm. or digital uh, based uh, media. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's, it's not a paradoxical situation, it's actually an, an ontological situation that one necessitates the other. It's a codependency that I'm interested in. And also by way of inversion, because most of what I do in painting is extremely regimented in terms of methods, because I only use methods of paintings that are cinematic. Mm -hmm. So I, I use the language of montage, and mm -hmm. even though it's only done manually and analog, Mm -hmm. wise and so on, it's absolutely cinematic and digital even mm -hmm. in its uh, methods of, of making. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the video, I do the opposite, the inverse of that, mm -hmm. and I use pictorial traditions taken even from Renaissance or even cave etching or ca carving, and I'm using actually a construction of space as an image, as a surface, and as a tactile image. So I think that there is a kind of the duality the, the two, the two foldedness that you're, you're seeing is actually the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we're no longer at the point that images and objects are kind of perceived as two different aspects of reality. They're the same reality. But I would definitely say that there is something about objects now that endow them with a sense of being in a place. That's what I mean, exactly. In other words, they, they al they're they almost inevitably robotical or mm -hmm. cyborg-y mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that 
It can be the most elementary of objects, like a painting or, uh, you know, a rock. But even though they are so elementary and ap appearing to be non-technological, non-artificial and so on, they already unfold in a matrix that is dominated by information flows. But you talked about rocks just now, so mm -hmm. I know you're interested in meteors. So why don't we talk Me a little bit about yeah. meteors? Well, meteorites for me, meteors are too big for me to too use. Too big, so use the little I'm ones. I'm using yeah. the meteorites. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by, also by minerals, and but I, I'm, I was always fascinated by meteorites and I had an early video t titled Rain of Meteorites that you saw, basically what you saw in the video is a shower of meteorites right hitting like a junction between Tel Aviv and Jaffa mm -hmm. uh, at that junction. And uh, this it fascinated me because natural disasters have almost a mythological sense or a mythologizing sense of politics. Mm -hmm. And we tend to do it a lot today to render politics almost in geophysical terms. Right. And so it's almost like part of our culture, late capitalist culture of outsourcing. We outsource political <laughs> problems to nature. Right. So we call it an ecological problem. <laughs> you know, it's like disowning the responsibility exactly. to, to change the situation. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so, but, but also there is a kind of a line in Blanchot when he talks about Foucault that always captivated me. And I immediately thought about the French word of catastrophe, which means starless. And, and meteorites seem to be coming the thought, like the thought that comes from the outside like something that penetrates our un existential universe from a, a cosmic dimension. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, the, equally is the most elementary and rudimentary form of, of body. Yeah. So, and, and I think that sense of marrying together the cosmic and the existential scale is fascinating. So there's, I, I often mm -hmm. use like real meteorites that I buy, but I also, fabricate meteorites and or use drawings and do all that interplay of on, on meteorites but i'm fascinated by this sort of coming from the outside you know penetrating a cosmic scale disrupting our existential finitude of modern modernity postmodernity and so on but at the same time you're there's one painting that you call accelerator accelerator um you're dealing with, in many respects, what the alchemists were investigating, the, macro, the relationship of the macro to the micro. And of course, at that moment when those two worlds meet, there's an explosion. Annihilation. An annihilation. I think all of these things are wrapped up in your paintings. They seem to point to this moment of the collapse of the macro and the micro, the subject and the object, if we think about it in postmodern terms. Is that how you think about it? Um, I actually, mapping? yes. I mean, uh, I would say yes. I mean, I, I have different ways of articulating, but there are, I would say there are multiple ways of articulating because uh, part of what I do in the painting is I actually try to, the, the imagery or the, I try the paintings to lead me. And there is a kind of a moment of uh, almost an acrobatic excitement about doing painting precisely because I'm not in complete control. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in the video work, I'm in control in, in phases. So you, and when you're not in control, you've annihilated yourself. Exactly. I'm able to participate in something that is purely subjective and yet at the same time is purely objective as well. And so that's that collapse. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, another way to put it for me is that Painting, on the one hand, is traditional, but also, for me, it allows revisitation of moments in traditions, like um, f two references, for example, or like Leonardo's kind of machines, not necessarily the paintings, right. mm -hmm. but the inventiveness of the machines, which goes also goes back to my drawing uh, practice and so on. Uh, and on the other hand, like early modernists, like avant-garde, like the futurists, like Boccioni or Marinetti that are trying to kind of capture movement, but in a tragic way, because they're trying to capture movement in painting, which is an inert art form. Correct. So the, the uh, kind of whimsical titles of accelerated accelerators, 
or about this sort of slowing down of perception that it's it's not no longer tragic for us it's merely i would say humoristic uh, to approach uh, the fixity of an image as as at all able to to capture change and even even this sort of annihilation that you're describing so it's it's a kind of a failed attempt to begin with but at the same time it's it's becoming the evidence of our attempt to account for such event of the macro and micro i don't know if i'm, I'm making sense so, here. Uh, let's let's go back to something because um you said it earlier there's another aspect to this though that that compels me to think that what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to paint the invisible yes i think so much about what we experience as visible is posited from invisible apparati that to some extent we we no longer look at the visible um there are like endless examples but the the kind of the intertwining between invisible and inv invisibles and visibles is so fine today that almost everything around us is is manufactured or in some way transcoded from codes into reels and then reversed from reels to codes that it's almost alchemical on our part to wish to see the transitions mm -hmm the the moments of uh as Joyce would call it of diaphanous transition between words and images mm -hmm. between sentences and music between uh the aperture of a landscape and its disappearance mm -hmm. so let's talk about the alchemical portraits so something we do know about the alchemists is that they were the last group of interdisciplinary hermetic philosophers after them we basically split apart the disciplines we eliminated metaphor from science but these portraits seem to imply a reintroduction of metaphor into the process of science is that how they work for you yeah I mean uh, and equally the introduction of science into art. Yeah. So it's in other words it's almost like uh, a mutual disowning that I want to to kind of challenge. But artists almost uh, inevitably accepted uh, the exclusion from science. Mm -hmm. So I mean my part with the all humility is not to introduce art to science but it's actually not precisely introducing science to art but to show the ambivalence of science and art the equivocation of forms and ideas and perceptions in science and art the fact that they're very liminal they're not either or they um, concur on two levels and unfold on two levels or or more on multiple levels and um, so there is a, a, an intrinsically heretical aspect to alchemy which I, I find personally invigorating because it, it relates to some of the radicalism of the avant-garde not in a kind of commercial sense mm -hmm. of the avant-garde not as the avant-garde is a parade of the new or uh, a kind of uh, the, the the will to shock in the in the fashion sense that Sprengler or Benjamin or Adorno mm -hmm. understood later well i'm 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 drawn to this title and the work in tropic language yeah i mean to me part of the anxiety especially in in modern and av the avant-garde tradition is this sort of absolutely insane notion that we have to explain art you know that art has to be explained as opposed to be experienced the the notion of entropy is also the anxiety that we have in trying to come up with a language that can both illuminate and explain what the functions or the even i would say the event of art is about but equally art after the avant-garde especially after conceptual art is intertwined with language to an extent that language itself is is uh, 
just part of the vocabulary, as you pointed out, in terms of reference to geometry and 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 language. It's part of the of the morphes of the kind of of the ideas forms of art making. So for me, the notion of ent- entropic is is really about the inability to find a one-to-one correspondence between what we see as language and what we see as objects or image, and the way that language itself takes a life of its own within the painting, but it's still a painted form. And I think in that sense, it's interesting because awareness that can only be attained when we are in some way navigating, going back to the notion of the map, on the boundaries of the map, Mm -hmm. not on the map itself. Mm -hmm. So the diagram, like the drawing, is on the boundary of painting. The painting itself can be extended with a pencil onto the wall of the gallery, Mm -hmm. which is another boundary condition. So I'm very interested in these sort of boundary conditions because they are the moments in in the visual praxis Mm. that we become aware, that we can almost smell ourselves as we watch a painting, that we can feel our bodies. It's not so much the object itself, it's pure awareness that a particular painting generates a feeling of physicality, Mm -hmm. of visceral physicality in ourselves. As Husserl would say, my, my right hand touches my, my, my left wrist. So which is which, right? Do I feel the pressure or do I become cognizant of me pressing my wrist. So it's an either or, but it's neither nor too. And that's the boundary line that, that I think is almost unique to uh, plastic visual art. And I think that's actually touching right at the core of the difference between what we can still roughly call video art and, and cinema, is that cin- cinema is being abducted by the cinematic spectacle, whereas video art still holds the keys for these boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. That it's not just about what you see, it's about what happens to you in terms of awareness. So this question of wisdom is interesting because in many indigenous cultures, this notion of wisdom is also brought about through the trickster. And I'm drawn to your painting called The Comedian. Do you see yourself as a trickster? In a way, the comedian is a trickster, because the comedian is is another form of liminality within the social. So the painting itself is is irreverent to any tradition of painting, uh, because it's figurative. It's a little bit like, you know, echoing even the bed bed um, the cow paintings by Magritte or by Kippenberger. I mean, there is a sense of ugliness, mm-hmm. uh, something we didn't talk about so far, but like the sort of repulsive beauty mm. and but there is also a sense that the representational form of the figure is also uh, awkward mutant inorganic uh, so that that is within the painting itself i mean there is a sort of an org- organism that is imploding and um, the 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 comedian is is a state of of uh, you know, is a state of being, too, in the sense of Dante. You know, you think about Dante Alighieri's The Divine Comedy, he called it the comedy, and it's like, uh, it's a very serious book. It has humor, but it's a very serious book. But in the sense, the artist, as opposed to the scientist, going back to this sort of division of labor and identity, the artist has to embrace the comic, because for the most part, the comic withholds more wisdom and truth than the tragic. Mm. Because the tragic is all about exaggeration. They, in fact, the Greeks and indigenous p- people or cultures n- know that. They know that the tragic is an exaggeration. It's us within the spectacle of society that we're like nurturing disasters because it's so spectacle driven. Mm-hmm. Whereas the comic, in some ways, is much more liminal, and it, it is going and back and forth between the worlds. Mm. So it's also a painting about between the world of painting and the world of contaminated imagery, of comic imagery, of irreverent imagery. <laughs>
So in the video work, you also employ the notion of the trickster because you're bringing the actor into the piece to play the scientist, but he's really not the scientist. So in a funny kind of way, the trickster's hand is in the directing of the work. But at the other, on the other thing I'd like you to sort of comment on is this notion that science does not really contain the comedic. We're not looking for funny science, <laughs> but we can look at funny art. Right. I think especially with video, and video works for me, the notion of the comic is very, is very evident. Because what it is, it actually, it's reenacting the absurd aspects of life that we almost moralizing to the extent of not seeing. Like the nerdic kind of scientist in the lab, you know, all that kind of male uh, nerd-ish aspect of science that is absolutely mis- and ill-conceived. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it, it also, uh, in a way, um, conceals the, the truthness about science making. But, but the truthness of science making in as much is like, uh, uh, also the bias that we have towards the comic. Because we think about comic as being stupid. And it's actually, uh, humors, to go back to the occultist tradition of the alchemist, the humors of the body, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. the fluids of the body. Mm -hmm. or uh, what e both energizes and rejuvenates and resuscitates the body. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, draws the, bodies from, the body from inertness, from stagnation, into re refiguring and reconfiguring the relation to the world and be to, uh, to ourselves. For here, in information as the form of being here or there or both, as a nucleus, or the instant, or both, for all nucleons, or instant. But observation itself permeates the collapse into one or the other. But observation itself permeates the collapse into one or the other. Momentum or location, but not both within the same instant. So the video work is also a kind of a comedia a sort of a comic put on that reality itself is tested. It's not so much about the artwork per se. It's about what the artwork allows us as, as an apparatus to tease and test the boundaries of the real. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, because it's viewed within a real laboratory that, that produces uh, plasma, not just documents or, but in effect, produces plasma, it has a veracity to it that overrides the fallacy of the performance. So there are kind of levels of comic uh, exploitation mm -hmm. and employment. And I, I'm, I think it's really important because I think that for me, the video works also are like a family name or a surname for my projects. They act as a preface to prefacing the work as, as objects or as segments and drawing them into a circle or w what you referred to before as a sort of as a mapping gesture that allows us to understand also them as, as a totality without totalizing them. It's funny. I'm, I'm drawn to it. And then as I'm drawn into the comedic aspect and the ludic aspect of how you generated the figure, I'm drawn into these other la layers, as you say, when you're describing the video work. There are these hidden layers. There's these notions of the invisible again mm -hmm. coming up. But also surprising. there is an intrinsic playfulness to it that doesn't precede anything else. It's just the mo embracing the moment through the pleasure of doing it. Which is why art liberates. And it goes back to the, one of the first questions that you asked me today about the seemingly duality between sensuality and conceptual, and conceptual grounds that is absolutely unified and integrated in the notion of playfulness. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the sculpture. The manifolds, what I call the manifolds, are 
again, they appear to be both natural crystals. They're made out of stainless steel for the most part. And, and they're specular, they're reflective mirror. And, and yet they're also extreme artifices or sort of fabrication that is beyond the kind of the human hand in, in a sense. But what is interesting about them as objects is that they no longer, even though they're three dimensional as sculptures, because of their mirrorized uh, surface, they actually cancel out boundaries for us and reflect the surrounding as opposed to delineate solidity in respect to the surrounding. So there's almost a representational sense that the sculptures are representational manifolds of the invisible because they're all facets of perceptions that disappear and yet appear in reflecting the viewer and the surrounding on different panels. And uh, the other curious thing for me about the manifolds is that they're actually created in a way unlike any found forms in nature, because they're not crystals. They're more like origami, but, they're, but they obey only the order of triangulation, which is unlike perfect origami that would change and, and invent different orders or different kind of polygonal shapes and so on. So they're only triangles. And the notion of the triangulation of these manifolds has to do with the sense that they, what they do, they approximate, they approximate circularity or the circleness, the roundness of space. So even though they're very sharp and linear, they create a, almost a rotunda-like movement around them. And, uh, and they have to be experienced. Again, it's very hard to look at, a, at an image and understand what it is. They, they photograph very difficultly. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to, they're purely experiential because they are like cinematic facets that, again, uh, reminds us that um, space is full of invisible points or transitions. Adam, this has been great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. Okay. It was a pleasure. See you. And because I think we're onto a, a stream here, I think if we break into the video notion, we might, um, um, you know um, what I'm saying? That's in a whole other tape. <laughs>